I know that probably one of the things that might drive y- you nuts, Allison, is like really blasé anthropomorphizing. What is the noun? Anthropomorphification. No, nope, that's too many Fs. Anthropomorphization. Anyway. No, really. Okay, nobody knows. It's fine. Anthropomorphizing, right? Okay. That that that's you've got to be careful, I'd imagine, in doing that observing vol behavior and then right away running and trying to apply it to people. But I mean, haven't have you ever found yourself in a scenario where you're on a date or you're watching friends on a date at a bar and you're like, that is classic four drink vol. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Have you? I, it's kind of startling, some of the uh, relationships. Yeah, it's, it's very similar in some cases. I, I have to admit, like, I, I'm a, I, like, I like planning weird events and parties and stuff, and looking at your slide with the two voles drinking, they're self-administering that alcohol, right? Absolutely. So you're not mm-hmm. foisting it. Exactly. They're raising yeah, their so hand. So that's one I of the great things round. about these studies is they can drink as much or as little as they want, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is a lot. That yeah. is great. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I immediately imagine, like, dude, if I was at that Vol lab, I would throw a party <laughs> where there was only, like, pebbles on the ground and we all drank from, like, elevated, you know, water bottle spouts. I think that would work. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you find that... So, um, hud- huddling is the term for That's Vol right. cuddling, and it's, it's very close contact, kind of mm-hmm. side to side. Mm-hmm. Do you find any behavior in the female who has been rejected in those studies? Like, is there some breaking plates or is there... (laughs) Do you see distress? Do you see signs of distress? No, not at all. So those Hmm. voles, the the strangers that may be rejected, so to speak, um, they have never been bonded to another animal. So they're interested in whatever social interaction presents itself, but they're not uh, probably heartbroken. But I mean, after the male vole has had Hmm. a few and he's decided that he's kind of equally interested in this new total stranger as in his long-term wife piece. Like, does the wife piece demonstrate distress when he decides to huddle elsewhere? Nothing we can detect, but we don't have a particular measure of that. So um, one interesting thing to note, though, is that all other aspects of behavior seemed really similar. So Mm. I mentioned that uh, usually when they're pair bonded, they show aggression toward outsiders. That also still happened. Even if they didn't have this partner preference where they're huddling together, they still showed aggression more toward the stranger than the partner, which shows that they remembered the partner. So alcohol wasn't affecting their memory, their aggression. It didn't affect mating, so they're still mating the same amount. Um, so well, You're not... I would be misunderstanding you if I said that it was... It's not the case that the male's like, that's my... Vol piece, <laughs> <laughs> and I might not at the moment be demonstrating a preference for her, but I'm going to be real mad if another dude steps to my vol piece. Is I, that right? I think that that's is so what it's insul- like. That's yeah. frustrating. That's a yeah. Frustrating so thing. what it okay. says, what it tells us, is that those two different aspects of pair bonding, the selective aggression and the partner right. preference, are actually dissociable. And right. so somehow alcohol is acting on the brain to affect partner preference specifically and not the aggression. Oh, interesting. Do you, does it, uh, am I correct in thinking that you're partnered? I know you are, because I think you mentioned it backstage, yes. right? Um, does your uh, hu- husband, husband, okay, mm-hmm. does your <laughs> <laughs> husband, <laughs> d- does your husband stay abreast of your work and is it important to you that he do and does he comment on it? Yes, well, he's actually a scientist okay. also. Uh, we met in graduate school. Mm-hmm. So, um, yes, he, he does know about this, and he <laughs> gives me ideas yeah. and all, all that good stuff that when you work together and have the same career. Do you, do you think that the work that you do has made you more thoughtful about what it means to partner with one another because you've thought about what kind of phenomenon monogamy is in the world? Maybe in some ways. So I think, you know, that I I shared the difference between social and sexual monogamy tonight, which many of you might not have actually thought of that concretely before. So just knowing that kind of information, I think, makes you think and approach things differently. Do you... uh I could, from my vantage point, I could could see you in um, in the audience watching, as I was, as Jeremy performed. And I think there was a lot of, it's, they're sad songs. So there's a lot of faces. I think when people perform sad songs, it's a very fine line between 
uh, expression wise enjoying a sad song and not enjoying a sad song at all you know what I mean so someone who's really into it is like and someone who doesn't like it at all you know looks almost indistinguishable for that um <laughs> I think we all liked it. Sorry, but we did. My like, that might just be my song. So actually, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I just mean that it's a thoughtful, semi-pained expression to watch a really good, sad song performed well. Um, do you? Th- do you? Does your work affect your sentiment in any way? And I ask that in part, like as we discover that there might be some. The, the physiological mechanisms of pair bonding, does that make it a less sentimental phenomenon for you? Does that make it more sentimental? Does it I'd affect have it? to just say that I'm a hard-hearted scientist and it doesn't really change anything for me. Wait, you're a hard-hearted <laughs> scientist and so you preserve yeah. your sentimentality? It's just, no, no, it's oh. just uh, logical. It's, it's a truth that happens yeah. and I like discovering these facts about the world and the way things work and it doesn't necessarily make me more sentimental. Uh, or, okay, so if, I, so, you know, if you ask someone what first attracted them to a partner, somebody might say, oh, he's, he's funny and he's, he's tall, or, or she, she was very clever. And she, do you, are you aware of the other factors that might tie people together? Like, oh, that's a, that's a compatible pheromone set between those <laughs> two. If only we could detect that, um, that would be great. But yeah, I think about that. Um, so there are studies about how uh, you know, people who look more alike connect yeah. more or yeah, smell these certain things and different complementary immune systems. I certainly think about that, whether, it actually, whether I can actually take that to the next step and think about it when I'm talking to someone or something like that. Yeah, no. totally. Do you, do you think it changes the way that you and your husband argue? No, nope. <laughs> totally standard. Because there, there's some, there's also, you know, when you talk about a spectrum of monogamy versus promiscuity, what's on the opposite? What is the opposite yeah, of monogamy? So there's non-monogamy and there's promiscuity. Okay. There's. Uh, I say that not as a, ju- I say that because I'd read for the record, not because I'm a prude or judgmental, but I'd read <laughs> online that maybe that was the other side of the term that scientists use mm-hmm. on that spectrum. Um, do you? It, it seems like recently there's been a fair share of research that might imply that there's actually a genetic component or a genetic predisposition to what makes people monogamous. Can you explain that in brief? Yeah, so first, uh, one really important thing we've learned in trying to study the genetics of monogamy or any behavior is that there's pretty much no way that a single gene can uh, predict that. Okay not even a handful of genes. But we know that the interactions between genes and environment are really important to consider. So that said, um, there have been a few genes that have been uh, studied in particular. So um, we've talked about vasopressin just briefly. And, and explain what that is. That's, a, that's sure. a chemical that our bodies naturally create that inform pair bonding, right? So And many other things, yes. Sure. So when women breastfeed, oxytocin is released, right? So they're yes. looking into their baby's eyes and the baby's looking back. And that mm-hmm. bond that is informed in some way, right, by this release of a particular neurochemical. Yes. It's also released during orgasm. Right. For, but inequally in men and women, correct? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, so vasopressin is one of these peptide hormones that acts in the brain and throughout the body. And, um, and it is one of the first things that was discovered about voles is that oxytocin is really important in the pair bond formation process, especially mm. for females, and vasopressin is especially important for males. So the vasopressin receptor has a particular uh, genetic difference in some of these vole species that are monogamous versus the non-monogamous ones. And so that was an initial uh, finding that people tried to follow up on and see if that could really explain this monogamy um, difference between the species. And it can explain quite a lot of behavior. By changing that gene, you can, can, you can change behavior. Can I, I'm going to try to paraphrase and then you tell me how I messed up. <laughs> Okay. 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 Is it the case that there is a chemical, vasopressin, that informs the extent to which a particular organism is likely to demonstrate monogamous behaviors, 
and that if we increase a particular organism's uh, sensitivity to that chemical, that they are more likely to demonstrate monogamous behaviors. That is the general principle, yes. It's Hell just yeah. more complicated because there are it's different yeah. brain regions yeah. where if you just turn it up everywhere, that's not gonna work, okay. right? Um, so vasopressin is also important for aggression, and if you turn up aggression too much, for example, Your date you're sucks. not gonna have bonding. Yeah, that, it's gonna be a really bad date. Mm -hmm. Right. Is it ever the case that as you are researching some of this work or reading it, that your brain flashes forward to a potentially dystopian environment? <laughs> Where angry partners are purchasing and secretly dosing their significant others with the hormones to stop them from straying? The future is now. You can buy oxytocin nasal spray online. And Do you? Yes. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I wanna, uh, in a second, I want to open it up to questions in case people want to ask uh, either, either Jeremy or, or Allison about some of the work. But first, uh, apart from the, the chemical prompts for the building of intimacy, I wanted to talk just a little bit about, you might have read about it in the New York Times, the experimental generation of interpersonal closeness. Has anybody ever heard of this test? No, did, you, did anybody buy that? Did anybody buy the custom cocktail outside? Yeah, okay, did you get a napkin with it? Like a red napkin? Yeah, was that, was that Ignacio? No, you got a napkin, fantastic. Okay, I'm gonna sit here at the front of the stage for a second, and I'm gonna pick two. Will you come up, please? Yes, yes, okay, you look to, I admit that I'm basing this in part upon like, I'm not gonna be rejected, fear of rejection. Yeah. Would you mind coming on stage? Yes, okay. This was a question set of 36 questions that was designed to speed up, take a seat, to speed up, like, what's it called? Huddle, huddle. <laughs> that means not moving physical contact, perfect. This was a set of 36 questions that was designed to speed up how quickly you got to know someone and specifically was designed to make two people fall in love. <laughs> Here's two questions, guys. You ready? What's your name? Aldrin. 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 That's a great name, man. Do you prefer digital watches and clocks or the kind with hands, and why? <laughs> uh, hands. Why? You know, vintage, old school. Yeah. Yeah. I think the digital is just, I don't know, like, less, less character. I think you're right, and I like digital, so that makes me feel far away from you, but feel like I know you. Okay, are you, are you digital or analog? Uh, analog. Why? I think the same reason. I think like old-fashioned. I'm done here. No, okay. <laughs> no, 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 we're not done, we're not done, we're not done. Okay, one more question. Tell your partner something that you like about him already. I really like your glasses. <laughs> I like your eyeshadow and your analog watch. <laughs> This could not have gone better. Okay. Give it up. Thanks, guys. Good, 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 good. Okay. I'm going to excuse you two. We're going to do uh, questions afterwards, but I got a couple gifts for you guys to find me afterwards. Yeah? Thanks. Thanks, guys. I was actually told by the WNYC venue that if there was a wedding that came out of that, you got a discount on the room, just FYI. <laughs> okay. Does anybody, does anybody have a question or two that they'd like to pose to either, I guess to anybody on stage or off? Yeah, we got one there. Can you help Pat maybe run a mic? Jennifer, have you got one? Third row. All right, third row. Pass, 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 pass. Hi, um, wow, that was loud. Yep. Hi, my name is Joe, and uh, you discussed about the effects that the alcohol had on uh, like same-sex pair bonding and also the heterosexual pair bonding, but those weren't in terms of like like partner sexual pair bonding. And so I was curious as to whether you had any insight on how that would apply to like human different sexual orientations. Yeah, it's really hard for me to extend it to that, be at, like Dessa said, um, at the risk of anthropomorphizing. Uh, 
but I will tell you that uh, with the prairie voles, we don't actually consider those same-sex pairs pair bonded because we don't see those same kinds of um, partner preference and uh, selective aggression and those hallmarks of pair bonding. So those uh, peer relationships are still really important, um, but it, they're not exactly comparable to the, the male-female pair bond. And so in the voles, um, it's never, as far as I know, been explicitly studied, but we, as far as I know, no one has seen particular evidence of same-sex um, relationships that would be considered you know, romantic, like the male-female mm -hmm. bonds could be. On the opposite side of the room from you and everyone you know, yeah. Can we play some passing the mic music? Could you write a theme song for that in the next 10 or 15 seconds? Thanks, man. It's already it's already um, yeah. So um, you were mentioning uh, alcohol is a vasopressant inhibitor and uh, I think imitates oxytocin. So I think uh, those were the two chemicals you mentioned were involved in pair bonding and were preferential for male and female pair bonding, respectively. Yes. So um, my question was, uh, well, I mean, there are a couple things. One, you said it didn't affect aggression, but you also said vasopressin uh, affected aggression voles. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, um, like, did you try any, like, like, uh, did you try any sort of vasopressin, uh, like, sort of, um, not catalysts, uh, like, did you sort of, uh, like, suppress oxytocin, for example, in females with some more targeted drugs, et cetera, or... Uh, I feel like you're from a rival New Jersey <laughs> event series <laughs> here to take my series down, man. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so basically you're asking, since alcohol also affects these neuropeptides that are important for pair bonding, did I look at how just directly affecting those peptides might affect pair bonding? Is that right? Okay, cool. So. Um, the answer is basically no, um, so that, that <laughs> could happen in the future, hopefully. Um, but when I tried to look at some indicators of what the neural mechanisms might be that could explain this behavior, I didn't see a lot of changes in those uh, systems that you would expect, like vasopressin and oxytocin. <clears throat> Instead, I saw a lot of changes in stress hormone related systems. So our, our hypothesis that we're working with moving forward is that this self-administration of alcohol, like we talked about, the voles are choosing to drink, acts as an anxiolytic. So what it dampens the stress system. Oh. So it's um, anxiety reducing. Um, so it dampens that stress system and that is what in turn affects the bonding abilities because we know from other people's studies that the stress system and how that changes in response to meeting and cohabiting um, is really important in the way that voles form their pair bonds. Are you a researcher? <laughs> you should talk to me later about like what's your... Uh, okay. okay, thanks for coming. Uh, okay, it sounds like we got another question. Ready to rock, okay. Yeah, um, thanks for taking our questions. That was super interesting. Do you ever, so how much, two-part question. Do you allow time for the, um, the animals to interact after they've, they're good and drunk? And have you noticed any patterns um, between the subjects that, when intoxicated, spend more time with their partner? So like, is there any patterns in what they do after they drink? Um, that is consistent with those who choose their partner to hang out with after they're already drunk? Good questions. Um, we really only analyze the behavior during the partner preference test. So um, the only thing that we did analyze while they're drinking and interacting is the number of times they mate, basically. Um, so we'd have to have something specific to look for and measure to be able to answer that question. So I'd like to know if you have specific ideas. But, um, and then your first question was? How much time? How much time? So 
the voles cohabitate for 24 hours and they have access to alcohol and water throughout that entire period. So they can always drink as much or as little as they want. And what we find is that the voles drink just a little bit all throughout the day and night. So we think they're kind of titrating this constant mm -hmm. just buzz dose of alcohol all the time, basically. Why, why is it that just putting to like, if I were on a cruise where there was an open bar day and night, you know, and I'm there with a dude, um, I don't know that just 24 hours of free alcohol would make him my pair bonded partner. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, why is it that just that is enough to bond them? Just because yeah. they're voles. Yeah, that's they're voles. The, that's the what question. They do. Okay. Yep, that's the difference between you and a vol. Good job. Hi. <laughs> 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 Let, hold on. Let's. Can we? Can we debut our mic song? Can we debut our mic music? <laughs> <laughs> do you have a question? That was a great lead-in. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Thanks. My question's for Dessa, if that's okay. Uh, yeah. Hi. Yeah, yeah, hey. <laughs> um, my question is, after moving to New York and going down the wormhole, as you said, um, are you over your heartbreak, and did all that research help? Next Wednesday, <laughs> I will be presenting my fMRIs taken at the University of Minnesota Center for Magnetic Resonance Research. So I have spent the past six months imaging my own brain in an effort to remove the love for my ex-boyfriend. <laughs> Pitch! That's a, a, a good answer, and for what it's worth, I'm a radiologist if you want me to read those MRIs. <laughs> Holler. <laughs> okay. On that note, can we, can we thank everybody who made tonight possible? The Green Space, WNYC, John Bernstein. Jeremy Messersmith, Dr. Allison Anaker, Jennifer Sendo, thank you so much.